today we're going we're gonna to talk about this idea of legacy living. Now, um, we have three kids, Sean and I, we have three kids, and we, and we have a grandbaby now, and so that's, that's all, ex- we're super excited about that, but, but Tyler, our firstborn, I remember being um, at Baylor University back in May of 2016, and um, Tyler had already, he'd already been accepted, and he was already going to go there, but in May, you know, he was still here in Allen, but he was going to be a part of the marching band, and so there was some event, some, something he had to go to, and so we drove down, he and I drove down to Waco, I dropped him off at the band hall, to do his thing, and then um, I, I was, I was, just had the opportunity to, I had to kill a day, and so I was just walking around the campus for a while, and as I was walking around the campus, my mind started, to, my mind really jumped to the fact that, you know what, this is going to be Tyler's home for the next four, I mean, we were praying for, the next four <laughs> years, right? This was going to be his home for the next four years, and I started thinking about him walking around campus, and doing life at Baylor. I, I was thinking about the classes that he would take, um, professors that he would have, you know, what, what kind of grades is he going to make in college, because college is not, it's not easy, you know, um, at least it wasn't for me, and, and um, friendships that he would create, just a lot of new stuff that he would be exposed to, just that you get exposed to, that comes with this next step in life. And as I started thinking, you know, about that, I, I got to admit, uh, I mean, and I still remember this, I, I got a little teary out. I mean, I wasn't like boohooing. But, you know, I got a little sad, and most of my tears were financial tears, but, <laughs> but some of it was, I, I just started thinking about his future at college, and then, you know, okay, well then, like, what about after college? And, and to be honest with you, I started to panic a little bit. Now, why did I start panicking? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I started panicking because the thought occurred to me that how he views life, how he views himself, how he views others, how he views God has been somewhat and probably would say largely influenced by his mom and, and, and me. Now, I, I wasn't worried at all about the influence of his mom, but when I started thinking about my part or my influence on his mind and his heart, my, my reaction was, oh crud, what have I done? What have I done? I mean, how does, how does he view, you know, how does he view the world because of of, of, of me, or, or um, how does he view people because of me? How does he see himself because of, uh, of, of my influence? How does he view the church? I mean, he grew up in the church. You know, does he love the church? Does he hate the church? You know, what, what, what does he think? How does he, how does he view God? How, what, what type of legacy have I built so far in his life? You know, because of my influence, how's this guy, how's he going to handle stress? Um, because of the influence that I've had, how is he going to handle conflict? Um, how is he, you know, will, will he be a good decision maker? How will he handle relationships? And then this just started snowballing. This is kind of how I go with my anxieties. Like once I get rolling, I just start going. And I started thinking about, okay, at this point in his life, he's only 18. But I started thinking, okay, what, what's he going to do for a living? What kind of what husband is he going to be based on what, how he's watched me? You know, what kind of dad is he going to be because of my influence on him as a dad, a follower of Christ, based on how I followed Christ. I mean, I was going into this full-blown panic mode. My heart was racing, my palms were sweaty, and I dropped down to my knees right in the middle of Baylor University and just said, God, what have I done? Okay, I really didn't do that part, but um, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was really, uh, really uh, kind of scary. But you get my point. Here's, here's the reality that, that, that is for all of us. Whether we realize it or not, leaving we are leaving a mark on our families we are leaving a mark on our friends we are living leaving a mark on other people that god has placed in our lives and so the question is what type of mark are you leaving now this morning we're talking about this idea of of legacy living and you can turn to your bible it's a deuteronomy chapter six we're looking at those first nine verses Uh, if you've grown up in church you've probably heard these verses uh, but w- I want to take a look at them, you know, and so legacy, you, you talk about that word legacy, and here's how it's defined as something that's been transmitted by or received from uh, a, maybe an ancestor or, or a predecessor. And, and if you have a pulse, and, and hopefully you do, uh, but if you have a pulse, then, then you're transmitting, you're, you, are, you, are, you are transmitting, you are, you are giving something, you know, and, and, and how we how we, and we're all transmitters. We're all doing it. Like I said, if you got a pulse, you're transmitting. Um, how we treat people is transmitting a message, a big message. How we post on social media 
That is trans, transmitting a message. Uh, we transmit a message based on what is really important to us. We transmit a message based on what we give our lives to. We, we, we're transmitting a message based on how we, how we spend our, 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 our money, the finances that God has blessed us with. We transmit a message based on what or, or whom we worship. The, the, the people that, that you know probably have a good idea of what we're transmitting. What, what kind of legacy are we building? And it doesn't matter if you're, a, if you're a senior adult or you're a senior in high school or you're, you're just starting school or whatever it is, you are building a legacy. Now, I have some good news for you. As long as, I've said it before, as long as you've got that pulse, this heart is beating in your chest, still pumping blood to the rest of your body, you are in control over what type of legacy that you are building. You still have control over that. And even better news, it doesn't matter if your legacy has been less than stellar so far, because I know that might be true for some of you, that, that maybe your legacy so far hasn't been that great, but God has given you a new day. And with this new day comes an opportunity to start rebuilding your legacy. And it may, it may take, take some time to, to undo some things, but God in his graciousness gives us a chance to start anew each day. And if we're building a legacy, wouldn't it make sense to build a legacy that matters for eternity? That makes a difference for eternity? Because as followers of Christ, now those of you who don't know Christ, this may seem a little different to you. But as followers of Christ, we, we're not supposed to just be thinking about today or building for today. Today is important, but as a follower of Christ, and this is true for everybody, we're all going to live for eternity. Now, at one point, our body, yes, this body's going to give out and we'll pass away. But after this life, there is another life. And so as followers of Christ, we are very aware of that. And so we need to live for more than just today. In Colossians chapter 3, it says this, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of what? Heaven. Where Christ sits on the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven not the things of earth. In Philippians chapter 3, starting verse 20, it says, but we are citizens of where? Heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. You see, this is, this is not our home. This is, this is not where we're going to be. We're, we're just, what does that old song say? We're just passing through, right? The Bible calls believers, they call them aliens or, or foreigners in this land. The idea is that, that we were made for eternity. So if we're made for eternity, let's build a legacy that will outlast just brick and mortar. Or let's build a legacy that will outlast just money or whatever. Let's build an eternal legacy, a legacy that not only impacts the people we know and love, but a legacy that will last for the next generations to come. I heard this um, in, uh, in our church. It was a study we were doing. This was several years ago. Um, but, but someone said that, that we, this is great, think about this, we are someone's ancestor. We are someone's ancestor. And how awesome would it be if you were seen as the ancestor that led the charge for a family or a, or a church living for the Lord for generations to come. Now we're Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I want to read uh, the first nine verses. And I'm reading out of the CSB, so your Bible might be a little bit different if you don't have the same translation. But it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then Revelation. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that far. Here we go, Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is what it says. It says, this is the command. This is Moses. Moses is talking to the people of Israel. This is the command, the statutes and ordinances, the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands. I am giving you your son, and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them, so that you may prosper and multiply greatly, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. 
Verse 4, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. So Moses, as I said earlier, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. And this is, if you remember the story, God, God used Moses to free the people from slavery in Egypt. And, and he's led them to the promised land. And they sent some spies into the promised land. Ten went in and said, hey, uh, this is no good. Two came back and said, we can do this because God said we can do this. But the ten, their influence was way stronger. The, their legacy uh, at one that time. And so what happened was, is God didn't allow them to go into the promised land. He sent them wandering in 40, 40 years in the desert until that generation, that disobedient generation died off. And now you have this new generation that's about to go into the promised land. And he's giving them instructions that God has given to him to pass to them. And they're supposed to pass on to their families and to the next generation. And I believe in these verses, these nine verses, that we, we can see the key to what legacy living looks like that, that will set, set the stage or, or lay the foundation to help us to make an eternal difference. Now remember, it doesn't matter your age. As long as you're alive, you still have time to build that legacy or rebuild that legacy. And it's a type of legacy that, that I believe that God is calling all of us to live. And, and I want to give you three, three things real quickly of what legacy living looks like. And the first one is this. It's this idea of unconditional obedience. So you notice when Moses said, listen, Israel, or hear Israel. And what that, what that basically is saying, is it's, it's not only just, hey, listen to this, but there is, there is an expected response. And the response is obedience. That's, that's what this, when, when, G, when God is saying through Moses, listen, it's not just, hey, listen and ponder, but it's listen, do, obey. And he repeats himself in the first three verses. He says, this is the commandment. He says that you may do them in the land. He says that you may fear the Lord. In other words, revere the Lord, keeping his statutes which, which have been commanded to you. He says be careful to do them. I mean, you, you, you see the theme there. It's just, just in those three verses. He says, he says something to the effect of obey, 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 obey. He says it five times that the people should keep God's commandments that were passed down from God to Moses and now to them. And why was it so important that the people follow the commands of God? Well, because it was going to be the key to their success in, in the promised land. And it makes sense, right? In order to live a life that matters for the kingdom of God, then we should follow the commands of the king, of God, that he has given to us. In Psalm 119, uh, the first eight verses, it says this. It says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes. Listen to these, these words. Seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but they follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. And according to the psalm, who is blessed? Who is the one that is, who's, who's given a life that is blessed? It's those who walk according to the law of the Lord. Those who, who keep his statutes. Those who seek after him with all of their heart. In other words, God says, here's what I want you to do. And as followers of him, we should do what he wants us to do. Now, I, 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 I love to play golf. I wish I was good at it, but I, I, I'm not that great at it. But I, I love to play it. And over the years, I've had the opportunity to play it at some really great courses. And I was actually invited on a golf trip. Gosh, I don't know how long ago it was. But I was invited on a golf trip to, to Pinehurst. And so for some of you Pinehurst, you're like, who cares? Uh, but for the, for the golfers in the room, you know, Pinehurst, they, they just hosted the U.S. Open at Pinehurst number two. Well, part of that golf trip, I got to play Pinehurst number two. And, um, and it, it's, it's a super hard course it, it, anyway, but I was invited by a friend. And the thing with playing Pinehurst number two, which is not true of all the other courses, I think they have eight courses total, maybe, maybe nine. 
but I know eight for sure. But the thing about Pinehurst number two is you actually have to play with a caddy. Now, a, a caddies, they're the ones that, that carry the clubs. They're the ones that clean your clubs. But also they tell you kind of, okay, on this shot, here's where you want to hit it. Um, or, or here's where you want to avoid. And, and it, I don't, it's extremely, for, for me anyway, it's extremely intimidating playing with a caddy. I've had that experience twice. One time uh, on our honeymoon in Jamaica. Yes, my wife let me play golf, but she was with me. So I didn't leave her at the hotel, but she played with me. We played with a caddy there. And then I played it with a caddy here. And it's extremely intimidating to me because I absolutely do not want to disappoint this guy. I am, I am a people pleaser, even though that's his job as caddy. And, and probably all of the bags that he carries every day, let's say he carries, it's too many. But let's say he has four that he carries that day. That's probably way too many. But three of the four are going to be horrible golfers every day. And maybe one is, is pretty good. But I didn't want to disappoint him. He tells you where to hit. He tells you how far to hit. And it's funny because he tells you like you're going to be able to do it. <laughs> And um, I was just like, man, you know what you just said? That would be awesome. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. And, and so, and I found myself saying I'm sorry a lot that day. <laughs> I mean, it, even, even before I hit the shot, I was just like, I just want to say I'm sorry. Because what you just said is totally not going to happen. I just want you to know that. But one of the best things about a caddy, especially at Pinehurst number two, because these greens are... They, they call them upside down bowls because they just, they, that's just kind of their shape and there's all kinds of breaks and all, it's just, it's nuts. They know how to read these greens. So when you're putting, he, he'll tell you because, you, you know, they, they caddy there all day long and say so they know all the breaks, they see things that you don't see. And I distinctly remember being on a green and everything in that, in, on that putt told me that this thing was going to break one way. I'm just going to say it was going to break right. But the caddy told me, no, nope, it's going to break left. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, the hill was telling me it's going to break right. Gravity was telling me it's going to break right. Never mind that this caddy has been seen this putt a million times. Never mind that his job is to, is to do this, read these greens. Never, never mind, because he actually hit a couple of shots. Never mind that, because uh, we said, hey, you want to shoot? And he did. He's a way better golfer than I am. You know, I was going to putt it the way that I thought it was going to break. And sure enough, I putted it that way, and it broke this way, and I was completely wrong. And against all odds, it went the way that the caddy said. And I looked at him, and he looked at me with total disgust. And I looked right into his eyes, and I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have believed you. But you know what? We do that to God, don't we? We do that to God. God says this way, and you're like, no, no, it's, it's, it's this way, God. God, you're the creator of the world. I get that. God, you, you, you are the name above all names. God, you are God. But you, you're saying this, but it just, no. I mean, and, and it would just stand to reason that, that God would know better, right? The Bible speaks of this over and over in Psalm. It says his understanding is beyond measure. First John, he knows everything. Isaiah 40, it says his understanding is unsearchable. It's just, we just don't. Romans, it says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. First Chronicles, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every, every plan and thought. And Job, it says, he, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Revelation 1, 8, basically this is a great statement. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, just a few verses in this, this amazing book. It tells us that it's probably a pretty good idea to obey God. Unconditional obedience. And you've, you've probably heard me say this. I know we've said this in the past years. But then when God, we need to give God our yes. It just needs to be yes. God, I know that before you say it, yes. The idea is just sort of giving God a, a blank check. You just sign it and you say, God, you write in the amount because you know better, you know best, you are God, I am not. I know I like to play God, but I know that I'm not. I am, I am very finite, you are infinite God, you are eternal, you are God, and I am not, and I need to give you my yes. And it doesn't matter what you ask. But, and that's what unconditional obedience means. It's not that you say, God, let me think about it. Or God, you know, let me, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me, I, I think, I think um, as long as I don't get a, a different offer, God, you're my God. 
Or, you know what, God, actually, you said this? I mean, I know I'm Jimmy, but I've got a pretty good idea of what I should do over here. Right? It's, it's none of that. You see, because here's the thing. God told them to obey, and they would prosper, and they would live well in the land. But here's the thing. God is under no obligation to bless disobedience. We can't look at God and go, why? You know, why isn't this working out when we clearly did not do what he asked us to do? And you will build a legacy that impacts eternity when you're willing to obey him uh, and, and say yes to him, whatever the ask. The second thing I want to tell you here is this idea, legacy living means undivided loyalty. Undivided loyalty. Now, the, the verse says, love the Lord your God. And, and the idea is it's, it's, not, it's not just an emotion, but it's also uh, this decision that said, I'm going to give my heart to you, to you and to only you, which that equals out to, to total devotion. Verse 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now, this is actually quoted by Jesus later on, right, when he's asked uh, by someone, what, what would you say, God, uh, Jesus, is the greatest commandment? Which is the one that we need to follow? And when you read that passage, you notice something that gives most people a lot of trouble. And if we're honest, we would say it gives us a lot of trouble, too. It's a small word. Three letters, and it's used several times in this passage. You know what that word is? All. A-L-L. Not the detergent, but all. All. And I think Moses was very deliberate here and purposeful when he said all. He knew the people, right? He knew the people of Israel. He knew their tendencies. He knew that they were a people who were prone to turn from God when things got difficult. He'd actually seen it 40 years earlier. He got them to the promised land. As a, again, it's called the promised land. It's not like, hey, I'll think about it when you get there, guys. No, it's like, this is yours. And they, they, they did not trust God with all their heart. They didn't love him with all their soul. They didn't do that. And so they were turned away for 40 years. And died because of their disobedience and their unwillingness to be fully devoted to God. He knew they could be easily distracted. And the same that it could be said for you. It could be said for me, for all of us. God's message for his people in scripture is the same message for us today. And he has called you, he's called me, he's called us to love him with all of your heart. And with all of your soul. And with all of your might. And I think it's important that, that we hear that word all. E even, I, I think we should, that's something that we should write um, uh, on, on places where we could see. You know, that might even be, I, I, don't, I, don't, have a, I don't have ink on, uh, you know, I have a tattoo. Uh, and not that I'm against them, I just don't have, mostly because I'm a weenie and I don't want to, I'm scared of needles. But, you know, I, I think, it, as I was thinking about this sermon, all might be a, a good, good little something to put somewhere where, where I could see it all the time. Because it's a reminder of, of what God has asked of me. More than that, it's a, what God has required. I, I don't know if you ever watched Parks and Rec. Um, um, it, it's, a, it's a funny show, and uh, one of my favorite characters on there is Ron Swanson. And if you know Ron, he's, he's the ultimate uh, man's man. You know, it's, it's funny. He works for the government because he works for the city, but he hates the government. And so he thinks it's all a scheme. But anyway, one of the things Ron, he loves to eat. He loves to eat. And he was, there's one scene where he's the waiter, and, and he, he tells the waiter, he said, uh, bring me all the bacon and eggs that you have. And so the waiter starts walking away, and, and Ron stops him, and he goes, no, 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 wait. He goes, I'm worried that you heard me say, bring me a lot of bacon and eggs. <laughs> he said, what I said was, bring me all the bacon and eggs that you have. He wanted to be clear. And I think God wants to be very clear. Being a follower of him requires our all. And Jesus modeled this. His son, 1 John 3, 16. It says, this is how we know what real love is. Jesus gave his life for us. So we should give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus modeled um, love for us. He gave his all to God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, it says, he entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood thus securing an eternal redemption. Again, an example of Jesus giving his all. It wasn't easy, but he was willing. And then Luke twenty two, forty two, 42, this is Jesus praying in the garden, literally begging for his life because he knows, what's, he knows the cross is ahead of him. He knows what's about to come. He says, Father, if you are willing, take away this cup of suffering. Now we read that and we, we don't, sometimes when we read scripture, we forget about what's happening, what's going on. 
the mental anguish, the, 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 the emotions that's here. And it is, it's God, you know, just kind of, I picture Jesus just on his hands and knees. He's just on the ground. Probably, probably, I don't know, but just the emotion of, of can you, you can just imagine knowing what's about to come, you know, the torture, the pain that you're, the suffering you have to go through, the death, okay? And he's just begging. But in the midst of that emotional, in, in the midst of all of that, he says, but do what you want not what I want. The key to all, A-L-L, is that last phrase. We have to say this to God. God, do what you want and not what I want. That's why so many people um, get angry with God, turn from God, run away from God, don't believe in God because their prayers sometimes center around, God, do what I want, and that's all you hear. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong to, to, to get angry with God or be, to question, because I've been there. I've been there many times where I've asked God, why? Why? But what God, in those moments, God is, is always faithful. But what God is calling us is to do, do all that he's commanded us. It's a powerful testimony. And it's what helps create an enduring legacy. And then the last thing, number three there, legacy living, it, it means this unashamed witness unashamed witness notice what moses tells the people to do with the commands not only to obey them but they are supposed to teach them diligently instruct people in those talk about them bind them as a sign on your hand they're to be on the frontlets uh, uh, on your forehead that you write them on the doorpost put them on the gates of the city in other words this there there there's no hiding these commands it's like it's not like you know it's we say this the relationship with jesus christ is personal but it should never be private you know, there's a world out there that tells us, shh, it's okay to believe what you believe. But just don't, don't, don't mess with us. But God is saying, listen, this is something that we are to pass on, that we are to tell. There's no hiding this. We're supposed to teach them to our kids. Parents, if you're a parent in here, if you're a grandparent in here, if you're an aunt and uncle, if you have any influence over kids, teachers, you know, anyone, we, we have a job to do. We have a job to do because it doesn't take very long for a generation to forget about God. We're seeing that. But especially just talking to parents just for a second, you've got a job to do. You've heard, uh, you've heard us say this before, and we'll say it again. Moms and dads, you've been appointed by God to be teachers of his word to your children. The church, that's not the church's job. The church is to come alongside you and to help you and to help, you know, help what you are doing at home and just be this be an extension of that but you are the disciple makers in your home and that's a huge part of the legacy that you're building and you not only teach your kids but we should model it those of us who have influence over kids lives it's not just it better not just be our words our words are important but it also you better model what you're teaching if you're talking about the love of god you better model the love of god if you're talking about the humility of god you better be a humble person if you're talking about god serving us then you better be willing to serve if you're talking about the grace of God, then you better show grace. If you're talking about the forgiveness of God, then you better be a person who is forgiving. All of us. And there's a progression here in the passage. It starts in our hearts, then we teach it to our children, and then, and then it goes out to the city gates, and, and, and we share it with the world. God's commands should be in our hearts, but then they should also flow out into our lives, both in action and in our words. Luke 6, the... 45 the second part of that verse it says for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of if your heart's filled with god and his leadership in your lives then that's exactly what's going to come out of your mouth you talk about you live out what is important to you what is what is in your heart psalm 96 verse 3 says declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples romans 1 16 says for i am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 2 Corinthians 5.20, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So a question is, is what are you talking about? Are you just politics all day? Like, blah, 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 blah. Are you... Sports all day long, blah, blah, blah. You know, what, what, is it, what is it coming out of your mouth? Because what's coming out of here starts in here. And so what we give this to is what's going to come out of here. And so I pray that what we give our hearts to, that we 
we give it to God. Because, and so I'm not saying don't talk about politics, but your politics are seasoned with God. Your conversations are seasoned with the love of God, with the love of Christ. You're, you're taking opportunities to share your faith. You're taking opportunities to point other people to God. Because you remember, you're, you're wanting to live a legacy, leave a legacy. And I can't think of a better legacy than for people who are in heaven or who will be in heaven one day because of an impact that you had, either directly or, or indirectly. You know, the people in First Baptist Church, Bethlehem, we, we met their pastor when he was here several years ago, but the ministry they're doing, we'll probably never, ever see them. But maybe one day in heaven. But because of your willingness to give and what you're doing, you're making an impact, an eternal legacy. And you know what's crazy? I, I was thinking about this. We're here today in this building because in 1878, kids out, they didn't have internet back then, but in 1878, people were obedient to God's call to start a church. And they had this really clever idea, since they were the first Baptist church to be established in Ablin, Ablin, Allen, you know what they called it? First Baptist Church. Creative bunch of people. No. But listen, I guarantee you they had no idea what their one act of obedience would result in 146 years later. I mean, eternity has been impacted in a mighty way because of about 50 people who were willing to give their yes to God, who were willing to follow his leadership and who knew that the gospel needed to be proclaimed in this small back then community and were standing on a legacy that they built. So what will be our legacy? What will, what will people look back and say about us 146 years from now? What will they say about our church because of us 146 years from now? We are at, right now, we are at a pivotal moment in our church's legacy building. And we are in control of what the message is being communicated to this community. And here, can I let you in on a little secret? It's really not a secret, you know this. But what you and we do now impacts the legacy that we're going to leave. It means, legacy living means we give God our unconditional obedience, we offer to him our undivided loyalty, and we are unashamed to tell the world about Jesus Christ. And may we be a people who are building a legacy that will make a powerful impact on eternity, and I pray that it will start and continue today. Let's pray. God, thank you that you call us to something bigger, something greater, than, more than we could ever think of or imagine, God. And I thank you for your love and for calling us to do what you've called us to do. But then more, more than that, God, for equipping us, for providing what we need in order to do what you've called us to do. And God, I pray that as individuals and as a church, we would be busy about leaving a legacy that would impact an eternity. God, I pray that all of us in here, that today we would say, I want to be the reason why the gospel is taken to this community, to the nations. I want to be the reason why people love Jesus is because of the life that I live, because of the actions that I took, because of the words that I spoke, because of the deeds that I did, because I was, I was following you and following your commands. So God, I pray that we would, we would make that commitment today follow you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.